uh, letters from the front. We have been handed a letter written by Dr. Frank Newman, a native of this town and son of Mr. James Newman, dated the 6th of April, 1900. Dr. Newman went to South Africa with his second Victorian contingent, but was unattached. It will be seen by the accompanying extracts that the doctor has had a busy time since his arrival, and besides studying the cases brought under his notice, he has been studying the events occurring around him. The letter was written from the Modder River and bears the date of the 9th of March last year. He says, quote, Since writing last to the parter from Kimberley, I have found my way back to this place. Then I was with the North Lancashires, and we were ordered down from Kimberley to escort Cronya and his prisoners to Cape Town. The day after arriving here and having had a night attending the Boer sick, I received orders to quit the Lancashires and join the number one divisional field hospital, and here I am at present, and likely to stay. Kronja and his men resemble swagmen of the most disreputable class. Kronja's entry into Moda was the cause of great rejoicing amongst the natives by whom, owing to his cruelty, he is not loved. He is a fat man, about six foot high, with a well-marked stoop and on entering here in a four-wheeled cart, clad in a slouch hat, dusty grey-green overcoat and dirty black pants, carrying a whip in his hand, he looked more like a dirty gunner than a general. Mrs. Kronja looked the picture of misery and was weeping profusely. She is not at all like the ordinary Boer women, being very thin and shrunken, looking with central incisors missing. Her dress was something like this, hat, brown, sunburnt, gem, trimmed with black band, face and hair to match band, but of somewhat lighter tint, bodice, black, long sleeves, slightly spotted with grease, a white transverse space to be seen between bodice and skirt behind, skirt matched bodice, lace at lower portion somewhat shreddy, one side of skirt slightly lower than the other, train short, boots partly laced and somewhat black, with coloured stockings, completed the costume. All the prisoners seemed to be glad they were taken and were quite jolly, the free staters especially so. They blamed Stain muchly for bringing them into the war at all. They made the night. Our regiment slept on the felt, guarding them. Somewhat dismal in the early part by singing a few hymns. I'm very glad that they are away in safe custody as they look and are a treacherous crowd. During their stay, I had a talk to Albrecht, their German gunner, who was also a prisoner. He is the man who used to drop 100-pound shells into Kimberley during the siege. He said all our Lidite at Magersfontein didn't do any harm at all and was much wasted energy and stuff. He was especially well guarded, having a sentry with a light in his tent all night, and besides this, there was a huge electric searchlight of HMS Doris playing on the camp all night. The last few days have been very busy receiving the wounded from Paderberg. The poor beggars were in a bad way as they all had three days transport in ox wagons before they got here. And you can, if you have the height of imagination, think of the awful agony these poor beggars suffered going over unmade roads in the rudest of vehicles and drawn by the slowest of animals and under the scorching sun over a waterless felt without shelter. Many had gunshot wounds and lots had fractured legs, but I think the cases of typhoid, dysentery and sun fever outnumbered the wounded by fully eight to one. Being subjected to such adverse conditions, the fever cases are naturally of a very severe type and they were simply dying of typhoid at the rate of about 24%. To add to the misery of these wretched sick, after we had got them into their tents and looked after them the best way you can in a field hospital, hospital, this locality was visited by a terrific dust and thunderstorm, the wind blowing such a gale that fully half the tents containing the sick were blown down, and consequently they got a fearful drenching, and those whose tents were not blown down got a ducking all the same. We got them fixed up, but unfortunately the storm recurred at 3am with a similar result. Fortunately, we have got rid of all the bad cases, having sent them down to the base hospitals, as they never stay in a field hospital longer than possible. This treatment and slow transport is a great blot on the last movement of our troops. 
you in the papers read all the sunny side of the attack, but unfortunately there is a very seamy side. Many cases were left undressed for 14 days, consequently sepsis is rife. I could give you many examples but will not worry you. The modern bullet is certainly very merciful being non-explosive. It does not tear the tissues but simply perforates and unless it strikes a large blood vessel or a vital spot, many cases recover. I've seen some extraordinary wounds well on the road to recovery. For instance, one man was shot through both temples, destroying both eyes. Another, a bullet entered behind the right ear and came out through the left eye, destroying it. Another was shot in no less than seven places. With all these inconveniences, after getting wounded or falling sick, the majority of the men are an uncomplaining philosophical crowd, and it is just as well as they are, as it is not the slightest use growling on a campaign, and I am sure no one who has not been through it has any idea of the hardships and inconveniences soldiers have to put up with. I'm well and have escaped any serious sickness. My present intention is to return at the end of the campaign if I am not popped. I will be shifted from here shortly up to Kimberley or Bloemfontein. I don't know which yet. Pyramid coming into Pyramid Hill. I have to say, I did not expect there to be an actual pyramid here, but gee, never seen that before in my life. So, this is the last stop for the day, Pyramid Hill. Uh, I don't know if you saw the pyramid coming into this little place. Now, this is a very flat area around here. We've moved away from the river moved away from all the tourists at Ichuka, walking along the Murray and kayaking and having coffees and all that. We're into dairy country. Around here is very flat and they've made like irrigation um, canals that come through this flat area and there's all these black and white Jersey cows and uh, all this area seems to be producing milk. Now uh, I was a bit worried because I saw that the Memorial Hall has the Boer War Monument and I thought, oh no, I'll never be able to get into the hall. But I think I've found the hall and I don't think we have to go inside. So this is a tiny little place. We used to come up around here for our football team. Heathcote used to play a team up here called Gunbower. It was a long way they used to travel for the games. Anyway, I think I already recognise the emblem of the Victorian Mounted Rifles on this monument because of all the others we've seen. And indeed, remember the uh, last episode in Yay? We saw that uh, same sort of plaque in the church at St Luke's. So it's the tribute of the officers of the Victorian Mounted R Rifles and non-commissioned officers and men to the memory of Private H.J. Hiscock of Pyramid Hill, who died at Bloemfontein, South Africa, the 19th of May, 1900. Now, Bloemfontein is the capital of the Orange Free State, isn't it? And I would say he's died of um, enteric fever or something like that. A granite obelisk donated by the Victorian Mounted Rifle members commemorates Private Henry James Hiscock who died at Bloemfontein in May 1900 during the South African Boer War. A plaque was added to the memorial at a later date which contains the names of those from the district who served in the Boer War. This has been listed as a separate entry. Heading, Death of a Victorian. From the age, Melbourne, 22nd of May, 1900. The Premier received a cablegram yesterday from the Governor of Cape Town reporting with regret that Private H.J. Hiscock 
of the Victorian contingent died of enteric fever at Bloemfontein on the 19th. The message evidently refers to Sergeant Henry James Hiscock, a single man, formerly a farmer residing at Pyramid Hill, who left Victoria on the second contingent. There is no private H.J. Hiscock on the rolls. Pyramid Hill Monday. The residents of the district were amidst the Mafeking rejoicings, saddened by intelligence of the death of H.J. Hiscock, a member of the second Victorian contingent in South Africa. He belonged to the Pyramid Hill detachment of the mounted rifles for some years. Deceased was one of the most efficient performers in the local brass band, which has postponed a concert on account of his demise. Lovely old 1920s Memorial Hall. Oh, look, there's more. The Honour Roll. This is a modern plaque of the South African War. Aiken, T.E. Blythe, J. Burroughs, T.R. Burroughs, W.J. Gamble, W. Hiscock, H.J. Jeffrey, G.E. Mahoney, A. McKay S, Malloy P, Penno W H, Slatter A H, Williams A, Williamson G C, G S, Williamson H J and Poor H R. Ah. Ah. Not sure why they have Poor R H on there. So this is your classic plinth, isn't it? The granite. Oh, I'm really glad we got to see that. And of all the places I've been today and I have done a lot of travel believe me I'll be glad to get home it's now what it's just after one o'clock so I'll be home at about 2 30 I'd say the pink's right and fired up for Brian tonight all was opened by Colonel Colonel Hurry in the uh, April the 22nd 8, 1925 the men of the Great War I see the little ticket office there. Maybe they showed movies or something in here. But yeah, of all the places, I love these little towns that, you know, there's not much here, there's just a few old buildings. Uh, I might get a pie or something while I'm here to promote their economy. All right, so I uh, hope you've enjoyed today as much as I did. It wasn't too bad, the driving, perfect weather. I'm in t-shirt now. So, uh, all right, over and out.